Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today for another one of HydroTerra's webinar series. Today, we've got some exciting technology news to share with you. Um, this really relates to a revolution in water quality pH sensing. And uh, what's exciting about this is that pH has always been challenging to do from a context of maintaining the sensors and today's presenters are going to be talking about a different approach for measuring pH which dramatically reduces calibration requirements which is so important when you're dealing with trying to measure pH particularly in sites where you've got a long way to travel so we thought that was worthy of sharing with you and the people who've come up with this technology are called AMB Sensors. So we're being joined today by Mark Pritchard, who's the Chief Commercial Officer from AMB Sensors. And thank you so much for all those early bird questions. There's obviously quite a lot of people interested in this sensor. So I really appreciate those ones. So we'll get on to those. So what does Mark look like? There's a picture of Mark. He's, um, as I said, the Chief Commercial Officer at ANB Sensors, and I'm Richard Campbell, Managing Director of HydroTerra. A little bit about Mark. So Mark commenced his career in technology, specialising in remote surveillance. Uh, really, his uh, history has been very heavily involved in taking those technologies and uh, building businesses around those technologies and scaling them. And uh, he really has had a, an international career, as you can see, he's worked in the UK, USA, Australia. He was in Australia for five years, so he understands us, South Africa and Belgium. So Mark specialises in identifying and bringing unique technologies to market. His strong background in managing OEM factories in Taiwan, Korea, China, Europe and North America provides an ability to be realistic in launching and supporting new technologies. I think that's really important. Um, he knows the challenges of manufacturing and uh, getting reliable sensors into market. He enjoys travel, avi aviation and winter sports, and he does fly his own aeroplane. We love your questions, as I think most of the people here know. So it's a huge part of our webinars. Uh, the, the way to lodge a question is to use the Q&A button, which you'll see at the top of your screen. Please uh, type your questions in there. And at the close of uh, Mark's presentation, I will read out those questions and uh, we will do our best to collectively answer those. A little bit about why HydroTerra runs these webinars. We get a real pleasure out of sharing knowledge and we're in a unique position to be learning a lot about technologies such as what's come across our desk with A and B sensors. So we like to share that knowledge. We play a role in facilitating education in how those sorts of things can be applied. And uh, we like to have an industry leadership position, and this is one of those ways that we do our best to do that. On to the topic of the day, a revolution in water quality pH sensing, calibration-free, time-saving and cost reduction. So how did HydroTerra come to catch up with AMB sensors? We were looking at a way we were looking for an option for our sites our customers often want to measure ph remotely and we were looking for an option that would allow us to do that without having to go to site as frequently as you normally would um, our approach to market at the moment is to be building more and more modular systems so some photos there of what do we mean by modular systems modular telemetry systems, which integrate the best technologies available, both for telemetry and for sensing. So we were out there actively looking for a sensor 
that we could use for pH. The sorts of applications we had in mind were for mine sites, for monitoring tailings, groundwater and surface water, and for landfill where we were looking at leachate, groundwater and surface water applications. So we're pleased to say that we've found a partner that can help go on that journey for us to produce these modular systems, but also it's a great opportunity to be a distributor for these sensors in Australia. So that was what we were looking for. The problem we were trying to solve, I guess, or the challenge was we wanted to find a way of with the calibration side of things of traditional pH sensors, they tend to suffer from uh, reference drift, thus they require regular calibration. And that just relates to the nature of the technology, you know, the glass membrane, et cetera. Um, biofouling, look, it's common across all sensors. So pH sensors tend to be subject to biofouling. And uh, we wanted to find a option which could limit that biofouling um, storage of pH sensors can be a bit of a nightmare. Um, they can dry out, or if you're dealing with an ephemeral stream, for example, the stream can dry out, and that can cause challenges for uh, those sensors that are deployed there. So uh, it can be quite tricky to install them to avoid that scenario. Um, and all pH sensors require regular calibration and maintenance for proper function. When I say all, Obviously, I mean all traditional pH sensors. So without further ado, I'm going to pass on to Mark to talk about A and B sensors and how their sensors deal with those challenges that I just listed. He's going to run through a little bit of a history of A and B sensors and how they developed up this unique pH sensor, uh, a review of the technology, the features and benefits, how they've integrated those sensors into some of their products. And then we will move to the questions and answers. So over to you, Mark, and welcome. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, I must say good morning or good afternoon to everyone who's joining the webinar today. We're very excited about this and working with our partner Hydroterra to introduce the products into the full market uh, down in Australia. So bit of history on the business um, we were founded in 2015 after one winning the uh, Wendy Schmidt X Prize out of some uh, trials that were carried off um, off carried off the coast of uh, Hawaii um, we took that money our, our founders took the money set the business up and over the coming years uh, the business was really grant funded from seed investment and then series A investment in 2021 and that's where we launched our S series sensors. We deployed about 50 units globally as um, alpha beta trials. Uh, all the feedback from those sensors was taken on board. Um, we then delivered all of those features into the new sensors that were launched late last year, which is our OC and AQ series sensors. OC for oceans and AQ for freshwater and aquaculture applications. Um, so they were launched as a technology late last year. They were launched as a product earlier this year, and we started shipping the units about 10 weeks ago, about two and a half months ago. And the feedback to date has been really, really uh, strong uh, globally on what we're delivering now in the new uh, OC and AQ series uh, sensor. So, so a long history with the business, really in-depth uh, trials and development uh, for the technology. Uh, it's been proven, it's been validated, and now we've launched the uh, the technology as a true product on the market. So if the next slide, please, Richard. Go on here, have a look of a little bit on how it works. So the slide that you can see there is with a, today's uh, pH sensor, a glass-based pH sensor. Um, and we can show there, that's a true reading of a, of a sensor in a tank. You see after 10 hours, there is drift uh, on the pH. Now, no one really knows, is that drift or is that a change in the pH level? And the only way you're going to know that is to recalibrate the sensor. So if you look at the next slide. So what we do, we track the drift. We have a reference tracker electrode within our sensor. And by doing that, we track the drift. And there's very simple uh, math equation to subtract the drift from the pH reading. And that gives us the true pH. If we look at the next slide. 
and that's the uh, the pH reading given from the uh, the pH reading that we're taking on the sensor and subtracting that from the the reference drift tracking uh, mm -hmm. that we hold within the sensor. Again, next slide, please, Richard. Oh, sorry. Again, very similar. No, back back one, please, Richard. Sorry. Yeah, so very similar. So the the graph on the left will show um, what the reading would be from a pH sensor today or a glass based uh, pH sensor. Never know exactly where you are without recalibration. And our reading, the reading on the right, um, we never need calibrating because we track the reference drift. And that's the main point. We don't need any calibration. And that's with zero calibration for pH, salinity, stroke conductivity, and temperature. We're completely calibration free. And in a nutshell, that's our, uh, that's our technology. So the transducer or the sensor itself is the black unit on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, the transducer is the inner face of the front of the sensor. Um, we've got 18 little dots in there, and those are our electrodes um, or our chemical pellets that we charge electronically. Uh, and we read the readings coming back from there to deduce the uh, pH and the salinity. Um, there's no calibration required, but we do require minimal uh, maintenance. And that depends on the frequency of the scanning. So if you're in a continuous scanning mode, and today uh, our continuous mode is one reading every 23 seconds, uh, you need to refresh the face of the transducer every five days. And that's really a scrub of the, of the face with a, a wet and dry sandpaper block. It's as simple as that. You can do that in situ, underwater, or take it out scrub it and put it back in the water and it will continue sensing. But you scale up there, so if you're scanning every 15 minutes, that needs to take place every 52 days. And from there, it's a direct linear equation. Uh, if you're doing once an hour every 208 days. So it's very, very, um, or very minimal maintenance required on the units. So that's what we call abrading the sensor. And then we need to do that every 15,000 measurements. Um, and after you've abraded the sensor 20 times, you then need to re replace the transducer. So 20 abrades means 300,000 measurements. And on the bottom left of the screen, you can see, you know, you need to re replace the um, actual transducer in more or less about three years if you're uh, scanning every 15 minutes. So it really is minimal uh, maintenance and extremely minimal ongoing costs uh, for managing the the sensor. Next slide, please. Over the years, we've had numerous uh, tests and trials um, of the of the units. Uh, we're out today. Currently, we're out in the Antarctic on the Sir David Attenborough uh, yacht. Um, the Aloha Cable Observatory is where we won the Wendy Schmidt uh, X trial. Uh, we've had numerous uh, deployments with NOAA, and there's units with uh, NOAA universities of well, three different NOAA universities in the US as we speak, having trailed the S series and now working with the OC series. Uh, we've been deployed on the Sir David Attenborough McBoat team at Boatface. Um, never ask the public to name the submarine. Uh, you come up with some strange names. And we've uh, proven that uh, we, we don't suffer from biofouling. We've been deployed out in the Mediterranean off the coast of Barcelona, which is a, a very high biofouling region. Uh, and you can see there on the images, the top image, uh, you can see the sensor, it's our old S series, but the technology is the same. The sensor there is completely covered in biofoul, apart from the face of the unit, which is the transducer, which is the active part and the important part. And um, you can see that completely clear. So we don't suffer, suffer from any uh, biofouling activities. Next slide, please. Okay, a bit more information there and some further trials. Uh, Psych was an important one because that's off the coast or the fjords of Norway a very uh, low salinity trial. Uh, we're integrated to a numerous uh, underwater vehicles. Blue Robotics is one of the main units that we're integrated with. And we've had extensive uh, tests and trials off the coast of the UK, the National Ocean Oceanographic uh, Centre and the University of East Anglia, world renowned. Um, top right hand corner of the screen, you can see some trials there in heated saltwater tanks. And that's with uh, our sensor and a glass-based sensor. You can see there, they're very, very similar in the readings. So next slide, please, Richard. So now we'll go through some features and benefits of the unit. Um, it's a multi-parameter sensor. The single sensor will give you conductivity, pH, and temperature. 
Next slide. Very simple to use, to deploy and to transport, and it's extremely rugged. Just mentioned about anti biofouling as a, it's an electrochemical reaction and a byproduct of that reaction uh, inhibits biofouling as standard. Next slide, please. It's solid state, so it's ideal for remote long term operations. And we're extremely small uh, form factor, so it's highly, ideally suited for uh, integrating and use on third party. Uh, product. We've got the uh, Blue Robotics ROV there and an Obscape PTM module for remote um, remote operation. And we give a choice. There's four sensors uh, available operating down to different depths. The features are between are the same between the units, but we range from five meters, uh, 50 meters, 300 down to 1,250 meter depths. And we're currently reviewing a 3,000 meter unit as we're speaking today. So. It's been, de it's been designed uh, to be integration friendly with third party products. So that may be third party telemetry update to systems, um, SCADA systems and various different uh, integrations onto submersibles and different telemetry systems. Just going back for a sec, mate. So that submergence yeah. depth of 1,250 metres is... Um... And that's very significant versus the traditional pH sensors. What's your you know, traditional pH sensors? What's the sort of maximum depth you see them coming down to? It's about 300 metres or? There are, if you go into the oceanographic side, there are some that will go down to 2,000 metres, but the price of those units is more than three times the cost of ours and they need calibration, which takes about three months. So it's a very, diff very, very different ballgame. Okay. Thanks for that. No problem. Okay, the, the sensors are, are adaptable. They'll, they'll work in fresh or salt water environments in any orientation. So you can just basically throw them in the water and they'll start sensing. And again, so another important factor is that we can store them uh, dry or store them wet. Again, very different to sensors that people used to and that means that they're very simple to store and easy to transport there's no special handling requirements for the units the units themselves are an integrated um <clears throat> excuse me sd card which will store over 15 million readings of conductivity ph and temperature and that really if you look at if you do the math on that that's many years of operation Digital units, uh, we don't have an analog output, so we don't have a, a 4 to 20 milliamp output. It's an RS-232, RS-485 serial or MOSFOS output, which makes it extremely easy to integrate with third-party uh, technology and third-party product. The units are extremely robust, and there's no special handling requirements, and there's no fragile components uh, within the sensor that you need to worry about for storage of a transport, transporting or for use. So the user can fully program the units to start, stop, and the frequency of sensing. So it's very flexible and easy to use. Are there any other things that you'd be programming into it above, above from that? In what respect, sorry, Richard? Oh, it just says fully programmable. So I'm just wondering, is it start, is start stop, and frequency? Is that, that they do things? But... Those are the ones that we're looking at, at the moment. We're looking at putting some um, alarms into the units, but that will be via an external GUI. Uh, so there'll be pop-up alarms on over and underage readings. Okay. Okay. And the units are automated. So there's an immersion sensor in the unit, so you can program the unit, power it up, um, and put it in the water, and it will start programming when it senses the water. That's very important if you're looking at uh, floodplain use or uh, uh, some some areas where you're looking in dry riverbeds and you want to know when there's liquid appearing, the sensor will automatically start when the, the moisture becomes apparent. Pretty clever. Okay. Okay, we're constantly monitoring ourselves. So they are intelligent units um, and we'll prompt operators if there any is any intervention required. So we'll give an output on health status, 
and an output on the transducer status. So it will tell you when it needs braiding, if there is an issue with the sensor as well. So it's very helpful for long-term remote operations. And that's generated straight out of the firmware, is it? Out of the sensor itself, yeah. Yeah. And it truly is a disruptive uh, technology. Uh, the, the units are patented and it's unparalleled by any other sensor that's available on the market today. Very affordable. Uh, I think Rich has got some pricing to go through at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation. Um, but we've just seen with extremely low ongoing costs and low maintenance costs, we're, we're delivering significant savings against conventional sensors on the market today. I think it's the, the, the this maintenance one is is the big one, right? It's uh, huge, yeah. End of the day. And it's reliable data as well. And you've had some applications where you've been deploying these in sediments as distinct from water, haven't you? Or yes, we concrete. Uh, various different sediments and also interesting down in, in concrete as well to um, check the maintenance of the actual the stability of the concrete on uh, some deep mining wells. So if you wanted to deploy these in you know, actual tailing sediments, for example, is, there, is that a reasonable application for them? It should be a reason. What we need to check is the actual uh, pH of the of the substance we're going into. We, we operate from two to 10 or one to 10 pH. We've got a good overhead in there, so we're okay up to 11. The higher the pH level, the more acidic uh, the sediment that we're going into, um, that could cause us some issues. And we, we tend to lose um, resolution as we go up the pH uh, range from 11 and above. Um, when you usually get to that range, people just want to know how acidic is it, yes or no, uh, not the actual specific measurement of it. Uh, so we just lose some of that granularity, some of the resolution in the higher levels. Um, and then as you go up to pH 14, obviously we're going to start seeing issues with the uh, transducer itself because of the acidity of the substance that we're uh, immersed in. Have you tried it out in, um, we do a lot of monitoring of the red muds that come out of uh, sort of processing of bauxite. Um, have you... You know, and they're pretty caustic environments. Have you actually monitored any of those or trialed those? Not, to, not today, but we're very keen to work in all of these new applications, work with people to, to see how the units perform in all these different environments. And, you know, that's, that's something that we actually um, promote is that we want to be looking at all of these different applications just to see how the uh, sensors are behaving. So in that sort of application of sediments, the configuration of the housing that you'd put around the sensor to allow you to drive it into the muds. Do you have anything for that? Or that's something that we'd customise at our end and it would need to be inside? That's something, Richard, that we, we take your lead on, really, and work with you okay. to deploy. That's very cool. Um, I'll go to the next slide. Um, this is the last of the features of benefit, benefit slides. Um, it's calibration free, and that's one of the main points uh, to remember and take away from from this uh, from this webinar is that we're calibration free uh, for cal for pH, temperature, and conductivity. So next slide, please. Okay, I have a quick overview now of the different products that we offer. This is a compatibility matrix. Uh, it's provided on the back of the data sheets and so on. And it just gives a good indication of the products that are available and the interoperability between those units. So next slide, please. So we have four sensors, AQ, which is for freshwater and lower depth ratings, five and 50 meters, um, at the OC range for 300 and 1,250 meter uh, depth ratings. Features between all of the units are the same. Uh, one difference on the AQ5, it has a potted cable on the rear of the unit. All of the other units connect via a six pin uh, subcon connector. Uh, the integration kit that is shown at the bottom there, that's really a bare board assembly. 
and that's for integration with third party products. And mainly submersibles where people want to take the unit uh, and integrate it within uh, their own specific submersible. I just mentioned some um, measuring of, of concrete pylons for offshore wind farms and so on and uh, drilling stations. Uh, we've had a number of people have just taken the sensors, embedded them in concrete, taken the umbilical out to the um, to the, the 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 technology platform behind, and then just simply after they've been in for a period of time, uh, they cut those cables and and then replace the um, the, the transducers within the uh, within the uh, cement. Okay. Next slide, please. I won't. Uh, dwell on this slide, but this is just giving a complete overview of all of the um, features and benefits that we just went through. It is a disruptive technology. We're extremely simple to use and we're calibration free. Next slide, please. All right. Richard, would you like to give an overview of the takeaways? Sure. Thanks very much, Mark. It's um pleasure. Thank you. I do agree. It's a disruptor. It's going to change the way we maintain a lot of water quality sensing zones for sure. So I think we heard it pretty clearly. Uh, big benefit with being calibration free. So for all the hydrometrics people on the call, I think that will be attractive to you. Um, it's very simple to deploy. Uh, storage requirements are much more simpler than uh, you know conventional ones uh, and the transportation is less risky um, I like the fact that it's got this sort of internal diagnostic function and feeds back to us the status of the sensor and whether or not we have operational concerns at any time um, so that providing correct data well you saw the slides about the drift and these sensors I mean that's perpetual challenge for a lot of people measuring pH. Um, and it should save us lots of time and money um, in terms of really getting that high quality data without having to go to site so often. Now, without further ado, because we had so many early bird questions for this one, I'm gonna charge on and hopefully we can get through all of those. So look at that. There's, 13 early bird questions, Mark. That's close to yep. a record. And Plenty they're pretty specific to what you're presenting on, which is excellent. So I'll read these questions out and then uh, Mark and I will do our best to answer it for everyone. So question number one, do you have a sonde with AMB sensors for pH, conductivity, turbidity and dissolved oxygen and other parameters for groundwater applications? So today we don't have a sound specifically. The one sensor will give you pH, conductivity and temperature. Um, we are actually working on DO, on dissolved oxygen, but that is 12 to 18 months away. Uh, but that's expected to be available uh, within the same hardware platform that we have today. And DO will be released via a firmware upgrade that people can, can purchase to achieve uh, that sensing parameter. Um, we're also looking at reducing the size um, of the of the actual sensor, so it will fit into some of the uh, standard sons that are available today. But today we just have the single sensor. It's a 41 mil diameter sensor, so it's a little bit large to go within uh, existing sons, but it is extremely light in water. It's four grams, so it is designed to be able to, you know, clip onto the side of an existing unit and then integrate into the uh, into the cons. I think uh, in summary there, um, the turbidity side of things uh, isn't isn't currently an option and DO is not currently an option. So no. it's pH, temperature and conductivity. If you do need all of those in one measurement sound, we can interface it back at HydroTerra in, you know, have multiple inputs coming into telemetry to do that, but you may get to the point where you run out of space down a sort of conventional monitoring well. Um, typically the diameter can get too big. So it depends a bit on the diameter of your groundwater well. Question number two, 
How is the acceptance for calibration free pH among regulatory agencies? Does it appear in the latest standard methods? Standards and methods. Yeah, I'm not sure on that one for your region, Richard. Um, I, I push that back to yourself if you could put that one up. What I could say is that um, we're working on a commercial basis with the regulatory agencies as the requirements come through. So what about over there in terms of you know UK, et cetera? Have they uh, embraced the methodology? We're working with the Environment Agency for use in up and down river uh, measurements from outlets. Um, there's no specific regulatory uh, requirement for that monitoring. Um, and we're just engaging with the Dutch uh, regulatory bodies um, to look at for use in freshwater applications. Uh, but it is very early days for us in those regions. Okay. Let's say we're, we're taking them one by one. All right, well, thank you. It might be worth us running some trials with regulators. Any regulators on this webinar? When we get in touch, we can look at running a trial as well with them. Question number three. I wish to understand lifespan of the sensor under various operating conditions, e.g. continuous readings versus timed readings. I think you had a pretty good slide on that. Um, I, I did, yeah, but it's a common question, uh, you know, how long will the units last? So just to recap, um, if you, a continuous reading for us today is every 23 seconds. Um, that That's our reading interval. Um, so if you're reading it every 23 seconds, you need to uh, refresh the transducer every five days. Um, and then you'd need to replace the transducer every 100 days. Uh, but if you take that out to readings every 15 minutes, you need to refresh the sensor every 52 days. And that means you need to replace it over a thousand days. So you're getting close to three years. And that's just a replacement of the transducer. Um, the sensor itself is still operational. And the transducers are very low cost um, to replace in comparable uh, application. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, question number four, is the pH sensor technology in use Australia currently? And what has been the Yeah, we've got a, a number of sensors out there at the moment uh, and a number of trials planned. Um, but we're looking, you know, on the back of this webinar to really launch it out into the market. People have um, looked at the sensor, or people like the CSIRO uh, body for oceanographic requirements, and we've got some units uh, that are deployed with them as we speak. Um, but as I say before, we're looking to now push the technology out into the market with our friends down at HydroTerra. So in terms of some of those existing projects in Australia, uh, are some of them with the water authorities, for example? For wastewater applications with two of the okay. utilities. Yeah. Okay, well, it'd be interesting to um, get their reports, I guess, in terms of they quite often do, you know, technology evaluation trials. It'd be interesting mm -hmm. to see those as well. Uh, question number five, is there a future where pH probes could be robust and accurate in field soil testing applications? That should really be possible what we're looking at is moisture in the soil so it would need to be a, a damp application if that makes sense um, but as long as the ph level is within the parameters uh, that were operational then that's there's no reason why we shouldn't be used there at all that's a good question i so is it the soil solute that's um being measured and uh, at what moisture content does your pH probe have? Yeah, that's something I. Yeah, that, that's something I need to check and come back to. That. I don't know that off the top of my head. No worries, Mark. It was a slightly curly one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question number six: Long-term stability of pH measurement in waters of varying salinity. That's probably the first part, and then propensity to fouling. I think we've covered already, but um, what about the long term stability question? Where you got yeah, okay. Now, our, our stability is driven by the number of readings that we carry out. Um, and as we say, we need to abrade 
every 15,000 um, measurements. Now we've done trials where we can see we have not lost um, resolution for a long period after that. We've given ourselves a good overhead on the 15,000 readings. We're going out to 17, 18,000 readings and we've seen very little uh, change in the in the uh, accuracy of the measurement. Just the window of that accuracy, the resolution uh, increases slightly. So you re-abrade and you're good to go again. Did that answer the question? Sort of. I was wondering um, just about this abrasion step. So those uh, units that you're putting into concrete, right? For example, how does that? Um, so that's that's a set and then throw away sort of scenario, is it? So it is absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Now we can extend. Now just to give you some background on that. We have 18 um, pellets within the front of the transducer and we, we we go around those pellets and charge them at the different times, intervals to get the readings of the pH. Now, if we reduce the pellets um, that we're reading, so instead of reading, I'm just trying to get my math right here, instead of reading all 18, we're reading three in each uh, section, um, that will extend the, the lifespan of the transducer transducer but it will affect our accuracy now for some of those applications whether in in concrete they're not really concerned over the accuracy so yes no question that they're looking at um so by the readings on the number of pallets that we manage we increase our our lifespan but we do decrease our accuracy yeah that makes sense question number seven ph verification in buffer solutions so has it yeah. against them? That's a good question. We, at the, we're looking, it's a very common question and we're looking to see how we can provide a, an answer for this because people take it, put it in a, in a buffer solution to make sure that it's operational. We don't operate today in buffer solutions. So we need to say to people, trust us. <laughs> um, but we do need to be able to provide a way of, of proving the, the operation to a pH level. And that's something that we're working on because it is a very common um common question we've got you know units out I've mentioned uh with the dutch at the moment and also in north america and other areas uh they've taken the unit stuck it in a buffer solution and and can't understand why it's not reading correctly because of the technology we don't work in that way uh, but we're looking at providing a solution so people can verify operation you showed um some data in an earlier slide comparing a conventional pH sensor versus the A and B sensor and it compared really well. Um, so I guess I'm just a little bit intrigued. So with a buffer solution, um, you know, you can measure using the conventional pH sensors as well. So just not sure why you can't just replicate that. So something unique about buffer solutions that are preventing you doing that? It's the strength of the buffer solution that they, that um, we, we in that manner. Um, the, the way to verify it today, to take a glass sensor, calibrate it, check the pH and check our pH. And you'll see that they're very, very similar. Um, obviously, that's not what we want. So we're, we're looking at finding a way to operate in those buffer solutions. But it's just it's completely alien. Uh, to the way we're operating today. Okay. All right. Uh, next question, number eight. Understanding how this works, question mark, in situ and at depth. Um, I think we've covered the maximum depth is 1,250 metres of submergence. Um, yeah. I guess if we're talking about depth below ground surface what's the maximum cable length that one can run to these sensors do you know well we're running on 232485 so 232 comms is what 20 meters 485 direct uh, cable attachments about 150 meters then if you go into data repeaters iot networking the units putting on telemetry up systems there's really no limit to the distance um of operation you know the units are ideal for remote operation because of the nature of the beast um you know we need a 5 to 42 volt 
DC input. Um, and with that, we then, you know, we charge the, uh, the chemical pellet. So it's an electromechanical operation. And we, we then read the, the peak uh, from those pellets to denote the, uh, the, the pH and the salinity. Um, and if people have got, you know, weird and wonderful applications, um, we can then look at modifying that peak response to, to um, really suit the application in question. Uh, hopefully that answers the, the the question there. I think it answers the second part. So the in situ bit, um, I think maybe they're just referring to understanding how it connects to the power supply, etc. Do you want to just yeah into that? Sure, sure. So the AQ five has a potted lead, and that's available with a one or a five meter cable that's attached to the unit that. So subcon cable that then goes um, or is provided via a pigtail and then you can just make that terminal off. The AQ50, OC300 and OC1250, they have a, a six pin subcon connector, a male connector fitted to the unit. Uh, so you require a six pin female subcon connector to, to take the data away. There's, it's a six pin connector. You've got RS232, RS485 and power. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Question number nine, what are the cost of these sensors and what is the expected life? I think we've covered the expected life. Uh, in terms of the costs, uh, in terms of just probably the straight, um, the simplest of their sensors, the AQ5, we're looking at a price of around four and a half thousand Australian dollars. It's based on current currency conversion. Um, we're looking also to provide these as modular uh, telemetered units that can be deployed straight in the field and they'll be, if for the surface water side of things, coming with a buoy mount and can just be deployed and connected up to satellite or cellular telemetry. So in the case of a unit that um, we've got names for these, like Yabby for the surface water buoy mounted one, it's going to be about six thousand seven hundred dollars for a fully telemetered floating module that is easy to deploy and then for groundwater we've come up with a magnificent brand name stygo which um will be approximately six thousand dollars for that same functionality um so that just gives you a bit of a feel for pricing but obviously give us a call and we can give you quotes um next question Question 10, what are the tolerances, e.g. saline water, high teddy water, et cetera? So is there a sort of salinity um, or a conductivity level that uh, is a safe point to deploy up to? Or is there I, I need to come back to you on that, Richard. I, I don't have those figures in my head. I know if you don't have the very low salinity level, um, 10 microsiemens and so on, then we're starting to struggle down at those levels but again we the more we're operating in these lower high uh, the low levels are the problems for us today um we just need to see the readings take samples of the water and and do some checks on them so i need to you know to give you a true fully fledged answer on that i need to come back to you the lifespan of the probe i think we covered that's due to the measurements obviously it can go up at least the marine level going up the other way so it's um... yeah yeah, it's got some good range there. Um, it'll be interesting to know for the sort of tailings applications and some of those sort of more hypersaline groundwater applications, what the threshold was at the other end. In Australia, we've got a lot of pretty uh, saline groundwater, so it'd be good to know that. Um, okay. So we will come back to the audience on that one. Um, question 11, what moisture levels are needed for reading in soils? I think we've said that we'll come back to them on that. That's another one for you to work yeah, through. Yeah, just, um, just on the, the time period required there, how long does a stable reading take? From power on, you'll get the first reading in five minutes. From power on. Okay. And that's how if long we take to set up. If you're operating in continuous mode, so once it's powered up and it's taken five minutes, then it's just... What, what's the maximum frequency that you're producing? Today at? is 23 seconds, every 23 okay. seconds. 
Um, that's going to drop very in the very near future to approximately eight seconds. And again, that's another um, feature that we'll be releasing on firmware. I would have thought that frequency is more than enough for most people. Um, question number 12, where can we find the current Australian standards about water, pH, chlorine and salinity? I'll come back to you on that one. I think that sounds like a bit of homework for myself. Uh, question number 13, would the sensors be suitable for deployment in deep boreholes? And so do they... Yeah, can't see any. Three, yeah, no issues there. We will go down to 1250 meters um, pressure underwater so that deep boreholes uh, really won't provide a, an issue for us. Now, we have got so many questions coming through, Mark, in the Q&A box. We've got 17 yeah. to get through. Um, Lots there. We've got, we've got 15 minutes left to run, though, so that's good. We should be able cool. to... All right, so Ross McFarland. Ross is a EPA auditor in Australia, so he uh, got to keep him happy. Hi, Ross. Uh, could you automate the abrasion maintenance? We haven't. Um, no reason why that couldn't be provided. Uh, we've actually spoken with a couple of the sun manufacturers where they they've got a little wiper on the front of the sun to to wipe the um, the glass base sensors that are out there today. Uh, that could be replaced by an abrasion arm and fitted. So it just like a windscreen wiper, it would abrade the front of the unit. It's nothing we've done today, but we have discussed it. Okay. So it's under evaluation of whether we can do that in the future. Yeah, it's under evaluation. It's not something that we're developing, um, but a couple of the sodden manufacturers are looking to, to provide that. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, next question, some anonymous attendee. Will this work in high solids applications such as mineral processing plants? So 20 to 50% solids. Okay. Again, I'll need to come back on specifics with that. Yeah. So I think that's, um, would be an exciting application to be able to explore. Um, that sort of relates a bit to things like the tailings, dams, application side of things. So uh, we'll come back to the group with some answers on that one. Next question from Mark Intervira. Can we use these pH sensors in soil profiles and at depth? I think we've answered that. So it sounds like it's going to be soil moisture dependent and Mark's going to come yeah. Us about Come back that. on that one. And uh, in terms of depth, there seems to be plenty of application for deploying it at depth. Next question Abdul Hanan Khan. Have I got that right? Which industry mostly using these sensors at the moment? Okay. Um, our main deployments have been in oceanographic applications that's where we've come from um we are now spreading out there's a lot of use in aquaculture and fish rust systems um and freshwater applications are now coming through in in volume so we've, we've moved down the salinity scale really and our, our full freshwater application is has just been released with the latest air film operation and the way our sensors work you don't have to tell it whether it's um, in fresh or salt water. It just knows. And we'll just start working with a moving window of, of operation between the different salinity levels. Um, so we've, we've come from ocean graphic applications and we move down into aquaculture, freshwater and wastewater. Okay. To give you some idea on, on freshwater, sorry, just some of the applications. Um, the Department of... Uh, the environment in the Netherlands are using them on some freshwater applications. Uh, we've got a number of sensors being that are deployed currently out in the Great Lakes in Canada. Um, and then some utility uh, companies are looking at in wastewater applications as well. So it's wide and varied, is what we're saying. So the in, in Canada, obviously, uh, freezes over, so it's got no issues with 
being frozen at various times? Um, not that we're seeing. Uh, as I say, they're deployed right now in the Antarctic on the Sir David Attenborough yacht um, on the ice shelf. So we're not seeing any issues there. If it freezes, then we need water moving over the, the transducer. Yeah. So we'll we'll lose readings there. Um, but in, in, you know, frigid water, there are no issues. And okay. there's three units being deployed next month uh, in Alaska for a six month deployment as well. So it shows we can cope with those those extremes. Yeah, that right. sounds, uh, sounds exciting. In terms of um, like that Netherlands example, is that monitoring a, like a river system or what's the actual surface water application? It's river, it's river systems that we're looking at yeah. and dams. And so they're boy mounted systems or? They're under trial at the moment. Right. So, you know, the, the use case will be varied. Yeah. Whether it's in a, a ferry box style application by the side of the river or boy mounted. Please. Um, next question around pricing. I've given some pricing, but just give us a call. It's going to depend on how you want to mount it and what telemetry you'd want on it. Um, as I said, we're putting together some modular options at the moment. Um, next question is from Peter Voltz. Is it possible to have an SDI 12 model? What would an STI 12 model be? <laughs> you can't mark. Uh, so SDI 12 is a comms protocol. It's very common in environmental sensors like you know, I think it was developed by the USGS years ago um so quite a lot of the sensors that we sell have SDI 12 as an option or mod bus it, it doesn't really um matter too much it just depends on what people are trying to interface their sensor outputs to in terms of the telemetry models so um some telemetry we have mod bus there today yeah so there's, us within the unit so yeah so there's no concern with um interfacing but in terms of an sti 12 that's just another comms option Protocol. yeah but it's not okay it's not the one that you've selected um we have plenty of telemetry modules you can plug mod bus straight into so that's fine yeah victoria hammers that fired the next question is this type of sensor suitable as a portable sensor, therefore not deployed in a single location with continuous monitoring, rather using the sensor for single samples taken in the field, like a handheld device. No, absolutely. Um, you can, you know, the readout is a digital readout. So you can look at a, a line of data at a time. It'll give you the, the three parameters uh, as a serial form, or we're just developing a GUI uh, for the unit that could be run on a, a, a small laptop. Uh, and then have the unit um, soft, you know, hand deployed. But absolutely. So is there already set up a portable, like people are used to picking up and using handhelds, to turning it on and seeing the radar? Yeah, we, we haven't got a handheld specific unit. Um, I know a couple of people have taken the, the AQ5 because it's the, the, the lower depth rated unit and they've deployed those in in hand, handheld applications but they've provided their own um interface not their own interface but their own uh, supporting product equipment for it so we don't have a a handheld reader with a pro that isn't available to that but that's something that hydroterra would look to to assist with um you know if there's if there's demand for that we could set up something like that for ourselves either as a rental um, or, you know, if you wanted to purchase it. Um, next question. What is the reference probe made of and how does the electrochemistry work without giving away all your secrets? It's our secret source. It really is. Um, the reference electrode is, is a silver electrode and that's really all I can go into. You sort of cut out just at that that critical moment. Do you want to say again the reference probe? Oh, perfect, perfect time. 
<laughs> yeah, it's a silver electrode. The reference electrode is a silver-based electrode. Right, and it's solid state, right? That's yeah. It. yeah. And you've got a patent on it, so does that mean people can go and have a look if they really want to know? If they want to have a look at the patents, there's multiple patents uh, lodged on the technology in multiple regions. I think there's 40 odd at the last count. So it's quite heavily protected. Um, but the, you know, the chemical composition of the, uh, of the pellets is one of the main, um, patented, you know, solutions that we provide. Um, and then the, the format of how we're reading, uh, those, those electrodes. All right. I'm just sort of curious if someone, if you put a patent on it, does it matter if you share the information? But uh, uh, I'll leave that one alone. Um, leave that one. <laughs> the anonymous attendee has thank you for the presentation. So thank you, Mark. This looks very promising. It's a pleasure. However, what are the limitations that a and B, not A and C, A and B are still ironing out with this device? Okay. Fair question. Uh, very low salinity. I mentioned 10 microsiemens. Um, we're, we're working down to those lower depths um, and fresh water we're just implementing now um, or was implemented on the release last week. And we're just refining that for the, for the really fresh water applications. Um, those are the main points that we're, we're ironing out as we speak. But all of those um, are firmware upgrades on the sensors um, that we're providing. Uh, a big issue that we're trying to resolve right now is uh, supply um, because we've just been inundated with you know, requests for product and, and so on globally. Uh, it's getting the units out the door right now and managing some of the supply chain issues on processors and so on. Okay, but it's, it's ready. It's uh, there. Oh yeah, it's deployed, it's, it's been proven. Yeah. Um, you know, it, uh, that's what I was trying to show on the first slide um, with the history. It's been developed over the last six years um, with the, the electrochemical part of the unit, which is the secret source um, for the reading of the pH. Um, that's been really been refined over the last six years. And we're just now putting that into a new form factor, uh, adding all the different features that people have asked for um, over that time period. So the, the unit is ready to go. And is shipping. Um, Roger Burrett's raised three questions and then he's uh, put them a bit further down and someone snuck in in between. So we will come to yours in a second, Roger. Uh, but the anonymous attendee who snuck in is asking, are you developing a mechanical auto wiper arm to provide the scrubbing abrasion requirement for maintenance? Yeah, uh, um, similar question a few uh, minutes ago, really. We're, we're not looking at that. We have spoken with um, some of the sun manufacturers who are looking to develop that uh, for us. Uh, it's on our list, but we've got a very long list at the moment. So I can say it's it's there, but there's no, it's not in the foreseeable future. Okay. Well, there's plenty out there, right? I guess it's just about yeah. taming with someone. Um Roger's first question, how secure are the sensors? How secure? Mm. In what, in comms or? I'm not sure. Um, let's I, come I back to that really one. Yeah. <laughs> um, question two was, could they be used in water treatment plants or swimming pools? Um, swimming pool, probably not suited for, for us today. Um, but water treatment plants, uh, we do have some uh, trial applications running through as we speak. Again, it depends on the on the, on the treatment that you're looking at, um, uh, you know, and, and the state of the of the effluent that we're treating. All of that depends on on the use case. Is swimming. But all I can say there, Richard, is is you know, if you and you do have any question, any customers with specific questions in specific applications, speak to us because we're, we're very open to, to working with our, our customer base to make sure that, you know, the sensors are delivering the requirements 
the, the, or the features and the, the operational requirements in the specific requirements people do have. Um, almost linked to that, I suppose, is do you have a connection with an Australian university such as ANU? Are you doing any trials with those universities? Anything like that? No, not with the universities. We are doing trials uh, with CSIRO on the oceanographic side. And um, there's a paper out at the moment from Rio Tinto on mining. Okay. What would be interesting is last webinar we had uh, David from the Rivers Institute of Australia they do a lot of monitoring and they've set up a sort of CRC for looking at um, monitoring technologies that would be smart to work in with them um, so they've developed a, a global lake monitoring network for example which is um, a big very successful um, enterprise so that's part of griffith university um but i can help facilitate that one um right next question anonymous one are there separate probes for freshwater and seawater or can one probe work in both environments yeah the single probe uh will work in both environments we auto sense whether we're in fresh or uh ocean water and um we have a moving window for sensing between the two so the answer is yes we've got a single probe um that will work in both environments okay and what are the stability readings reading times like again i'm not quite sure on the question then um i think with a lot of sensors like if we're doing um groundwater sampling you have a certain time that you wait for stabilization of your parameters but often that relates to the water you're pumping through them rather than okay uh, so I think it might relate more to your earlier comment about it takes five minutes before yeah it's yeah to make its first reading yeah and then the stability when we're up and running that's down to the number of measurements taken and we report out on that so you'll know you know we say every 15,000 go upwards in in requirement uh for the abrasion and we report out on that um on the comms so it will tell you when we need abrading and all we do the, the the um the accuracy gap widens slightly as the abrasion re is, is required more and more okay now the next question uh we've got five left open and we're just run out of time so we'll can are you happy to continue on mark you'd be waking yeah, i'm good one. yeah i'm good <laughs> you're a good man all right so it's time to get up now <laughs> that's exactly right thank you for getting up so early by the way um it's no problem can commands be sent to change the frequency of sampling rates based on things like water levels ph values etc e.g. the sensor is initially configured to sample hourly but if the pH drops below six commands are sent to change or maybe below commands are sent to change the sampling to 15 minutes um yeah, I'm hesitant there because yes it is possible it's that that structure isn't available in the in the protocol today um but that would be a very you know if you if you've got a simple terminal program that you're reading the information from and we can set some triggers up to sense the levels that are required for action to be taken a command string could then be written to be sent to the sensor to change its parameters so in, in, in theory yes but it isn't there today it's sort of interesting it's a bit like we do quite a lot of automated stormwater sampling and you have yeah. a, a trigger and it you can go to a, a higher frequency of reading but that's sort of commanded from the module that we have above it worth okay. us exploring um absolutely next question is from anonymous attendee what parts need to be replaced i think 
one part and that's the transducer it's a very simple job um if you remember how the sensor looked like on one of the earlier slides and um, the on the face of the sensor you've got that the slightly different color um circular piece on the front you remove two screws pop a collar off prize the transducer out push a new one in put the collar back in with the screws and you're good to go again um takes less than five minutes very simple to do good that's our next question does it have gps built in or would it need to be coupled with other sensors with gps yeah nothing built in but i know from speaking with you richard that's something that hydroterra could provide yeah uh next questions from jacob growth growth sorry jacob can you program sensor through third-party data logger or do you need ip software user interface to program we've done a number of integrations with third-party units and they have been available or capable of programming the unit so the answer is yes it would again it would depend on the integration and the level of integration um that's provided but we are very open our full protocol and command set is available online um and all the crc commands are on there as well so people can take that and program it as required and look we're going through that right now um, yeah so if you've yeah. got further questions on that jacob just give us a call um we're setting up various modular units that we we interface with a range of different modules at the service. So um, yeah, probably best just to give us a call. Um, another one from Roger: security in public areas. I think what we're getting at here is, um, can we just deploy this down a well hanging from a, a well cap, or is it always connected to a, a module with a power supply at the surface? um and how do we make that secure okay we, we always need a power supply there's no integral power supply to the unit we do have um some battery packs that we've just released but those are for really oceanographic long-term deployments um, but there's no reason why that couldn't be used in a lot of the mining applications and so on that we've mentioned um the remember the looking at the sensor there's two grooves around the side and those are I, are there for uh circlet mounting um but then that would have to uh in a form to suit the application hopefully that answers answers the question for you yeah roger it'll certainly be easier for me to answer that question for you once we've um, finished developing up these module modular units we're looking to launch them around early august about the fourth of august i think it's our plan so um be able to answer those specifically then um comment from Medi Zaboli from Centec good to see you there Medi um I don't know if you know Mark Centec's an Australian founded business that developed up some fantastic uh, soil moisture monitoring technology based on capacitance readings um Look, we could do a bit of a paired study there using their um, capacitance probes and comparing against um, yeah. when your pH sensors um, started to kick in and work at different moisture levels, I guess. That might be an interesting yeah. study. Um, to know. And we do have a lot of them deployed out there, so that, that may not be a bad idea at all. Um, next question, will you develop lab bench type sensors? nothing planned at this point in time uh we're looking at environmental sensors um for deployments out in in oceans mining applications uh freshwater wastewater applications okay well mark we've actually done it well done uh, i've only got there. a few minutes wow. over on this uh the duration um really like to thank everyone for attending today it's great to have so many people but it is a unique technology and um, I think you should be proud of yourselves for having developed it. That's uh, that's really good progress. And I'm pretty sure the, 
the hydrometrics people out there and others who have to measure pH will uh, appreciate this advance in technology. So thanks very much for attending today. And Ritiv, thank you for uh, arranging this webinar. We, now we really look forward to working with HydroTerra uh, going forward and seeing what uh, deployments we can see. Excellent. Well, Mark, you go off and have some breakfast and uh, we will all get on with our <laughs> afternoons here in Australia. But thanks very much for getting up early. Okay. No problem. And thank you, everyone, for attending. It's been a pleasure. Bye for now. Cheers now.